says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained from the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, O oh, uh, through the Spirit, under unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of gra gra grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Father, we ask you tonight to bless the word of God. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I pray right now, Lord, you'd anoint my lips and stir something up in my heart to preach this message, Father, uh, in the power that it needs to be preached in. Lord, I I'm asking, Lord, that you take what's said tonight and drive it to the home to the hearts of these folks. Pray that every spiritual need in their life would be met. I pray, Lord, that when they leave this night, they might have said, it's been a good day. Uh, God's spoken to my heart, and uh, they've just enjoyed themselves. Father, we're thankful for the news from the hospital tonight uh, concerning Rhonda and Terry and that little girl. Lord, we're thankful that that little baby was born into a home with two parents that love the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we think of all the babies that are going to be born this night in every hospital around this city. Lord, I can't think of a finer family to place a little girl in than the one that was placed tonight. And I'm thankful for that, Lord. I pray that you bless them. And Lord, uh, just uh, give them grace now in these weeks to come. I'm thankful for Barney and Phil having their little girl. And Lord, thankful for how good you've been. And for these other ladies who are going to be delivering in the upcoming months. Lord, we're thankful for, Lord, uh, having a fruitful church like this. Lord, we praise the Lord for that. And uh, Father, we're just thankful tonight to, to be on, uh, on the side of God that can experience His mercy and grace tonight. And Father, we just pray you take this message and use it for your power, according to your will, and according to your purpose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In this passage, the last two verses deal with the flesh and the Word of God. Verse 24 says, For all flesh is as grass. Well, in what respect? It says, The grass withers away. Those of you that have grass, I've got a lot of weeds that seem to be like the Word of God. They endure forever. But uh, the grass withers. And you see, as the fall comes along, that grass dies and becomes dormant, and it withers up and falls away. And there's nothing you can really do to keep your lawn, you know, absolutely perfect. It gets old, it dies, and the weeds take it over and everything else. And so it is with the flesh. No matter what happens in this life, everybody ends up in one place, and that is in a hole in the ground. As Solomon said, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to the dust again. It all of us, for all of us, it ends up in a box with our pretty little head laid on a silken pillow in a beautiful dress or a nice suit. They close the box and they put you in the ground and in three weeks the, mo the worms are crawling all over you and the maggots are eating you. And just as the Bible says, you're back to the dust. Not so with the Word of God. It goes on and on forever. It never decays. It never decomposes. The Word of the Lord, the word of the Lord will outlast the world. The Bible says the heavens will pass away and the earth will pass away. Second Peter chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 24. But the word of the Lord will endure forever. The word of the Lord will never pass away. There will never be a day in eternity even when the word of God is outdated. Bless God, that Bible will be with you throughout the ages of eternity. As eternity rolls on, you'll still have the word of God with you. It'll be living inside you. Amen. Brother, you'll have the mind of Christ. I don't even think you'll need a Bible. you have the whole thing committed to memory. It'll be part of you. That'll be the Word of God with us forever and ever. You know and I know what the Word of God has to say about the flesh. Jesus Christ said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The two different things, the flesh and the Spirit. And in fact, in Galatians chapter 5, we are told that these two things are against each other. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, they're contrary one to the other. The flesh and the Spirit never get along. They never learn to get along. They never will get along. The only time they'll get along is when the flesh drops to that grave 
And then that spirit is clothed on with an immortal body, one that's lacking under the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the flesh and spirit today, they never get along. In fact, we learn from the Bible that the flesh does not produce anything of eternal value. Jesus said the flesh profiteth nothing. Paul said, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That wasn't written to a lost man. That was written to a saved man. In your flesh tonight, born again, child of God, there is not one good thing that resides in your flesh tonight. And when we refer to the flesh in the sense that I've been talking about, we don't mean actually the skin and the bones except in the matter of death. When we're talking about the fact that in the flesh dwelleth no good thing, we're not talking about the material, but we are talking about the sinful nature that indwells the flesh ever since the day that Adam was sinned and passed that sinful nature on to us. Now, there's not too many Christians tonight that would argue with what I've said concerning the flesh, except, of course, this sinless sanctification crowd who've had their fleshly carnal nature eradicated. And, of course, we're not hard on them. We pray for them, for the Bible says to comfort the feeble-minded. Amen? Not too many Christians would argue doctrinally about the Bible's position on the flesh. However, there are very few Christians tonight that take the Bible view of things when it comes down to them dealing with them in a personal case as far as their personal life. They'll make excuses. They'll justify. They'll defend their flesh. They'll defend their sins. They'll defend their wicked actions. And what they don't realize, they are defending something that God said profits absolutely nothing. They're defending something that Paul said, and it dwells no good thing. And they end up defending something that God says is just absolutely worth it. Now, preachers have been major offenders in this thing. They've used their spiritual office to justify the acts of the old nature with such phrases as, touch not God's anointed, and such phrases as, nobody tells the man of God what to do, and phrases like that to justify the acts of an old sinful and carnal nature. On the other side of the coin, there are those that feel that if one punishes the flesh, it produces a pleasing result to God. The term for this act is called penance. It involves everything, anything from a religious repetition, such as a Roman Catholic says when they say the rosary over and over again. That's penance. I do sin, so I say the rosary over again. It involves something all the way from that, all the way down to taking a whip or a knife or something cutting the flesh in order to produce something pleasing to God. We find in the Bible a case where that happens. We find in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 18 that, prophet, that the prophet Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And they have a little contest up there. They say, they say now let's, uh, let's see which, which one of you can call down fire from heaven. So old Elijah gets up there and says, you first please. So from the morning all the way up until noon time, they holler and scream and cry and go through their, their religious ritual and try to get down and get Baal answer, but Baal wouldn't answer. So what did they do? The Bible says they began to cut their flesh. And it says, after their manner. It was a regular thing that they did. Until the blood gushed out, it said. They began to cut their flesh, hoping that that would please Baal. Them cutting themselves and bleeding, punishing that flesh, they thought would produce something that Baal would be pleased with and he would answer. Physical punishment in that way has always been a mark of satanic worship. For we read in the Bible about God forbidding the children of Israel to send their children to the fire of Molech. The God of Molech required sacrifice at times and they'd send their children to the death to a fire. Punishment of the flesh. Punishment of the soul. They thought that would please God. And God said you not to do that. We find it in other cases. In Buddha, for example, during the, the DM's um, reign over there in Vietnam, those of you who remember the Pictures in Life magazine and Time magazine of the Buddhist monk sitting out in the middle of the street dumping gasoline on himself and then setting himself on fire to his death. Punishment of the flesh in order to please what they call God. The Bible never requires, never implies, or never suggests that you punishing your flesh or putting any premeditated, premeditated uh, wounds on your body will ever produce anything spiritually. The flesh profiteth nothing, the Bible says. Whether you punish it or not, the flesh doesn't profit anything. Now, I'm going to preach to you tonight on the Christian's attitude toward the flesh. And yet there's two aspects, aspects to that thing tonight. There's the aspect of the Bible doctrine about the depravity of man, the flesh. That's what I've been talking about so far. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. 
And yet there's another aspect of it concerning the body itself, as I found in Ephesians 5.29, where it says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. In other words, you say, Well, I hate my flesh. I do too. I hate that old man. He's never done a thing for me. He's never helped me out. He's never produced anything for my children. That old man never has. I hate that, but I don't hate this right here. I mean, if I hated that, there would be some acts of hate against it. No man hates his own flesh. He tries to take care of it. Amen. There's, there's another aspect of it. The Bible says in Romans 13, it says, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. What you talking about? The body? No, it's all about the carnal nature. Romans 13 is all about the carnal nature. Well, listen, if you don't make some provision for the body, you'll be hungry, you'll starve, you'll stink, and you'll be sick. And you don't make some provision for the body. There's a little white porcelain thing that sits in your house that I hope you make some provision for the body for and get in it every once in a while. It's called a bathtub, amen? You don't make some provision for the body, you make uh, other people a real upset, see? And so it's not talking about not making any provision as far as clothing and food, but talking about the carnal nature. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the carnal nature tonight, but I'm going to be talking about the body. I'm going to be talking about a Christian's attitude toward his body or toward the physical things, and this is going to be more of a teaching message than it is a preaching message. I have no idea why God impressed it upon my heart. At least I hope he did, but I hope you'll get something out of it. Number one, I want to say this. You have to live in that body as long as you're here, so you might as well get used to it. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but honey, while you're down here, you've got to live in it. You've got to live in it. Now, we can preach against the flesh and confuse the two so much, the carnal nature and the body so much, that you're walking around hating the very thing you're walking in, see? You've got to get used to living in this body. And if you don't, you'll never be able to produce anything of the Spirit for the Lord Jesus Christ. You might as well quit griping about it. Everybody has the same basic affliction, a carnal, sinful body. Amen? You've got to have it. And that's the way God meant it to be. So you might as well get used to living in it. It's not going to go away, and it's not going to change much from now until you go home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a strange day today. We live in a day when unprecedented attention is given to the flesh. And mainly by means of the media, by means of television, by means of magazines, by means of movies, we live in a day and age when there's unprecedented attention given to the flesh. Why, you look on TV, the whole thing is about the flesh. Every uh, commercial is about the flesh. The soap opera's got the names of the soap operas from the soap companies, mainly Procter & Gamble, sponsoring those things, trying to sell you stuff that would make you smell good, look good. They used to have a toothpaste that said, if you brush your teeth with that, give you sex appeal, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't get rid of them brown spots on your teeth. What are you talking about? But they're trying to sell you that if you put this, if you put this certain kind of deodorant, you know, under your arms, you're going to have to carry a stick with you to knock the girls away from you. You know that kind of thing. It's it, it, it's all it's all a great big attention at the flesh. You take the magazine. All these magazines have these Hollywood starlets, for example. All these girls are, are on the front of it all the time, these model-type girls with the wonderful physiques. Attention given strictly to the flesh. Why, you run around this town, when I was in high school, there was never the things around there. There's health spas in every area of the city right now. There's racquetball clubs, indoor tennis clubs. Now they've got fat farms all over the world to go and lose all the fat. They've got places we've got to pay $1,000 for them to starve you. Now, if that ain't dumb, I don't know what it is. But they pay great money to go down there and have them starve you. You know what it is? It's all this attention given to the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. Every spring and fall, you get new fashions come out. You know why? You've got to make the flesh look good. New hairstyles for the women. Flesh. All that kind of thing. Different colored contact lenses for your eyes. Make your eyes look different color. You know what it is? It's flesh. 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 An unprecedented time where we have a great deal of attention focused at the flesh. You have a cosmetic surgery now. Facelift, nose job, teeth cap. Try to change your figure. Take off some here, put it here. All to make the body look more appealing. Of course, what they don't realize is that all flesh is as grass. Doesn't make any difference. 
Well, some of you ladies, if you could, if you could have the the, the, the the bodily measurements of some of these Hollywood uh, ladies, you know, some, it would change you one bit. You'd be the same person. Because the person's not the body, the person's on the inside. But you live in a day and age when there's unprecedented attention given to the flesh. And I feel sorry for some of these young ladies. I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry they've got to be put through the pressures that they're put through every day in school and that kind of thing. They can't grow up normal. They got all this, all this stuff put on the flesh. All this stuff. You got girls, uh, 10, 11 years old, wearing eye makeup and all sorts of stuff. Say, so what's the Bible say about that? I'll tell you what the Bible says. It says about it. It says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What's that about it? Unprecedented day we live in, in dealing with the flesh. Now, I'm sorry to say, it has crept over into churches. And into Christian schools. In Christianity, more and more attention is being given to the flesh. My son goes to a Christian school. I've been very pleased with that Christian school. I wouldn't, wouldn't really criticize it for anything, but I just want to give you a note. The Christian schools are beginning to emphasize the same thing the public schools are emphasize. They're beginning to emphasize athletics. They're beginning to emphasize the point where a kid that's got athletic ability is better than a kid that doesn't have athletic ability. And that's just like the public school system. I went, to a, I went to a Christian school, and you know what they had? They had a spirit queen. They had a girl come out, and then all these girls come out. And you know what they did? It's the same cotton-picking thing as the homecoming queen beauty contest with a different name on it. That's all it is. Just flesh. That's all it is. And I hate to see that in a Christian school. I know one Christian school has got a tremendous basketball team. It's not around this area. They got a tremendous basketball team. So you know what they did this year? After they started their Christian school, they're now coming back and they're playing public school. In basketball. But let's keep our Christian standards. We won't let our cheerleaders go to the games where we play the public school. Now, brother, that kind of junk is just too funny for words for me, man. I mean, I don't know who they're fooling, but they're the, I tell you, whoever they're fooling, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. All that stuff is a bunch of flesh. You go into churches today, you got these singing groups. All the young ladies and boys get up in matching dresses and matching coats and ties. They all have the little costumes that they get up and perform in. You know what that is? It's all flesh. That's what it is. You live in an un, a day of, of unprecedented attention given to the flesh, not only in, the, in the, the world, but also it's crept over into the church. I went to a uh, meeting not long ago, and they had the, you know, the young person's ensemble get up there. All the boys had their pair parted in the middle with a bunch of billy goats, you know. <laughs> Ruffled shirts and all that kind of junk, you know. They all dress alike, look alike. You know that stuff is? It's all flesh. That's all it is. You live in a day and age with there's unprecedented attention given to the flesh. Basic principles we need to look at tonight. It's not enough to believe the right thing. We must not only believe the right thing, but be able to place that truth in the correct relationship with the other truths we learn. In other words, we must not only have the truth, but we must learn to place that truth in the correct place so we have the right priorities and the right emphasis in our life. For example, out on that sign on the door, out front, maybe you know some of you never read it, we got a, we got a, a word out there that says, believe, Believing, Teaching, and Preaching, the King James Bible. Okay? You know what our stand is on the King James Bible. Anybody in here not know what our stand is on the King James Bible? In five years, I've preached one message on the King James Bible in five years. Listen, I don't need to get up here every, every week and tell you what I believe. All you got to do is hear me preach for five minutes, you'll know what I believe. I don't have to stand up here every week and tell you, now listen, folks, we believe the King James Bible, we believe the King James Bible. Anybody that listens to you or to me for five minutes knows that's what we believe. Once you take your stand, you don't have to keep standing there and tell them what you believe. Same thing with separation. You know what our church services are? They are just a complete repetition of our personal convictions over and over and over and over again. Well, brother, when I come to church, I've already got my convictions there. I need my soul fed when I come to church. See? And we need to place that thing in the right emphasis. You only get one body in this life. You only get one. I know many of you wish you could get another. But you only get one. And uh, if you don't like the way your body looks, just look at your parents. It's their fault. <laughs> you look like them, don't you? <laughs> I mean, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Old Cam, he's going to be kin to a stump the rest of his life. 
I kid ain't got nothing to say about it. Nothing to say about it. He'll never play for the final four. <laughs> you know, basketball. <laughs> he'll, 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 he'll never make it, see. I mean, he got cursed with a curse, see. Mom and dad, see. That, that kind of thing. And uh, you only get one. And you don't get another. And you know something? You either spend your life controlling that body, or you spend your life have that thing control you. It's one or the other. You either get that thing of a subjection, or you get it, it controls you the rest of your life. Now, while we don't put a lot of emphasis on the flesh, or we, I trust we don't, we should not put a lot of emphasis on the flesh, there is still a crown at the judgment seat of Christ connected with a Christian's attitude toward his flesh. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 for a moment. While it is not the most important thing in the world, it is important to a certain extent. You have one body, you are going to get only one body, and what you do with that body, and how you treat that body, and uh, your attitude toward that body is going to depend, a lot, of, a lot of your spiritual attainments are going to depend on that. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we read in verse 23 where it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, a physical race he's talking about. So run that you may obtain a spiritual um, illustration. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. He's controlled. He's moderate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Any athlete going to obtain uh, something that's going to rust and die away. Full that. But it's not us. It says, but we and incorruptible. Now what's he talking about? He says, therefore so run, I, so run not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, Watch the body. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There is a crown and reward connected to the judgment seat of Christ for how a Christian takes care, how a Christian rules, how a Christian controls his body. Now, it is not the most important doctrine in the Bible, but it is an aspect of the Christian life that we need to look at tonight and something about which many things are being said today. Do you realize tonight there is nothing on this earth that you can do to guarantee yourself good health? Not a thing. There is no plan, there is no method, there is nothing you can do in this earth to guarantee yourself good health while you're on this earth. And another thing to remember, no matter what you do, no matter how hung up you get in this stuff, someday you're going to die. And you're going to go to the ground and your body's going to rot. And I want to speak on some specific things for just a couple of moments tonight. Number one, let's speak for a couple of moments about the diet of a Christian. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. You understand that? Every creature of God is good. That includes a pig. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. There are no dietary laws for a child of God written in the Word of God. The only one... It's found in Acts chapter 20, or excuse me, Acts chapter 15. Turn over there. Acts chapter 15, there's only one dietary law written to a Christian. Acts chapter 15 and verse 20. But that we write unto them, speaking of the Jews, Christians, writing to the Gentile Christians, that they abstain from pollution of idols. No icons, no idols. And from fornication, that's obvious. And from things strangled, there's one. And from blood. So the dietary laws of a Christian, not to eat something that's been strangled. Uh, and you can't eat blood. In other words, when we eat something, we bleed it first. Both the only dietary laws I know in the Word of God contain, uh, pertaining to a New Testament Christian. Therefore, my friend, 
when you find anybody trying to tell you that there are dietary laws for a Christian, they're wrong and you shouldn't listen to them. It's not right. The Bible says nothing is to be refused or to be received with thanksgiving. Now, don't you ever forget that. There's a lot of fellas preaching things today that ain't Bible. Now, natural foods are not a spiritual qualification for anything. For a man to eat natural foods, and I don't use any chemical fertilizers, it won't let anything chemical, chemically it's been tainted touch these lips. And you know where you'll end up? You'll end up in the same box as the guy that eats sap donuts every morning and drinks a Coke. Amen? Same box. Now that's the one side of it. Here's the other side of it. You ought to eat right. You ought to eat right, number one, because of health. You say, what's right? Right is according to your conscience and the knowledge God gives you. That's what eating right is. Eating right is not eating what I eat. I eat certain foods in certain ways because of the way they affect me. And the same thing may not affect you the same way it affects me. But I'll tell you what this thing is. It's a sin to eat junk food your whole life if you're not healthy. It's a sin to load your body up with sugar and stuff like that if you're sick. That's obvious. That's common sense. There's, a, there, there's no conviction about that person. Well, that's just common sense. It's stupid for a man to eat wrong if he's not healthy. You ought to eat right because of health reasons. Not only that, you ought to eat right because of expense. Now, the money you got is your own. Okay? The money you got, the way you spend it, frankly, it's none of my business. Spend your money any way you want to. Acts chapter 5, while it was thine own, was not in thine own power. Where well, you spend your money is your business. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you're one of these people that just can't seem to make it from payday to payday, and can't, you say, I can't afford to tithe, and you're running down and getting the chips and the Pepsis every night, and all that kind of stuff, and you can't afford to, and you can't afford to give to God, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. You ought to eat right because it's too expensive not to eat right. Now, if you've got all the money and you can do that, that's fine. I'm not saying anything about that. That's, that's your business. I'm just bringing out some points that maybe you ought to consider. What's the best rule? Go by good common sense. Go by good sense. Understand, begin to learn something about how the body works and find out the way your body functions and begin to eat so that you might use this body for the glory of God. I mean, brother, I'll tell you what, this stuff can go so overboard it's ridiculous. Now, brother, I enjoy eating, and uh, like I told you last week, it's the only thing we got left almost, you know. I enjoy it. But I mean, some people just go haywire on I, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to control this stuff. I, I, I finally figured out a good definition of quenching the spirit. It's a guy that when we have dinner on the grounds at the church, it's the guy that prays and prays that God, please don't let us be gluttons today. That's a guy that's really quenching the spirit, you know. Amen. You realize there's very little in the Bible. I, you know, the Bible never, God never rebuked a fat man one time in the Bible. Do you ever read about what he did? Do you, do, you ever, do, you ever, do you ever read in the Bible where God put somebody on a scale and said, Naughty, naughty. Okay. No. The Lord concentrates on the sins of the heart. See? And I'm not, I'm not justifying obesity tonight, understand? I'm trying to get you to put it in the right place. We have got this unprecedented attention focused on the flesh today. And we need to put that stuff in the right place. Different people respond different ways to different foods. I never believed people ate like they did until I came to Kentucky. I never did. Now, I was raised without a frying pan. I never ate fried foods. I mean, honestly, I didn't. I just didn't eat fried foods. To this day, I can't eat a lot of them. I remember one Sunday, man, I ate, I, I ate a bunch of Kentucky fried chicken. And I don't know if that was the best stuff I ever put in my mouth, man. The middle of the night, man, I woke up with the greatest gut ache you ever saw in your life, man. I about fell out, man. I remember I was over in North Carolina or South Carolina about five years ago. And over there they got the greatest seafood in the world, but it's all fried. And I usually eat I usually eat it boiled or sauteed, see? And all they had was fried. I had a great big plate of that, fried oysters, fried clams, fried this, fried that. Same thing happened. Middle of the night I had the biggest gut ache you ever saw in your life. I just don't function on that stuff. Now, some of you guys, I swear, God lubricates your system with it. I mean, they can't eat nothing without grease on it. 
I bet there's somebody that puts bacon grease on the cornflakes, amen? I bet there is. And uh, some people eat well that way. And uh, I'm not saying you ought to eat like me, but I'm saying if, if, if it bothers you, you ought to quit. What about vitamins? To take them or not to take them, that is the question. <laughs> uh, you've got this day and age where Christians have attached a spiritual significance to the type of food and the type of vitamins a person eats, and that stuff's of the devil. That stuff's of the devil. Brother, whether you eat at McDonald's or whether you go down to the, the health food store, it don't make a lick of difference to God if you're doing what you ought to do spiritually. It don't make a lick of difference. If you know better, do better. But isn't it amazing how some of these people that are on the natural foods are sick all the time and the other people aren't? That's what I can't understand. What I'm and I'm not making one fun of one group or, or, or the other. Really, I'm not. I'm just saying, you do what you want to do, and you do what you want to do, but let's not get in a spiritual argument about the values of either one spiritually. Vitamins. If they help you, take them. If they don't, don't. I know with me, I'll give you two examples. Brother John Young. Since he started taking alfalfa and something else, he's had a, a condition, a sinus condition cleared up. He's real happy with it. The more vitamins I take, the worse I feel. Well, I was taking a multiple vitamin and a B complex and a vitamin C. I couldn't hardly get out of bed this morning. I was so dragging. I don't take nothing now. I don't take anything. I feel better when I don't take them. I don't begrudge people to do My kids take them. I'm not begrudging that. But I'm telling you, you can shove vitamins in your body till they're just up to here. And it's going to make one lick of difference as far as you serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If it makes you feel better, take it. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Some good common sense is involved in this thing. Do you realize that your body can only assimilate so much? Only eternity will reveal what a, what a vitamin-rich sewage system we have in these days in which we live. Brother, your body only takes in so much, and then the rest of it goes right out the sewer. It comes right out. I mean, really, your body can only take in so much vitamins, and then it sheds off the rest. It can't, it can't take them in. And these people that try to attach a spiritual significance to take them. No, now, you've got to take these natural vitamins. You've got to take this and you've got to take that and you've got to take this. They had the same problem in the Bible. Same problem in the Bible. Peter comes down there. He's eating meat with them Gentiles. Boy, he comes down there. He's with them Gentiles. He's having a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. He sees some Jews come walking down the road. He says, oh, <laughs> I better get out of here. <laughs> and he steps over to one of these people that guy eat that swine flesh, see. And you know what the Bible says? Paul came down and he said, we stood him face to face because he was to be blamed. Because he was acting one way in front of one group of people and another way in front of another group of people. I, I got to get a kick out of it. I went into a guy's store one time that was showing Shackley vitamins, you know. And uh, uh, he was a friend of mine. And he was selling Shackley vitamins. And it came time for lunch. Brother John Young and I were there. And I said, well, I'll make a run down here to the burger chef. And he said, yeah, give me a, give me a double cheeseburger and a... <laughs> And the milkshake. Here's a guy selling the Shackley vitamins. I said, boy, I said, he said, oh, I just sell those things. I eat this other stuff. <laughs> it's your choice. It's your choice. I'm not telling you to do one or do the other. But what I'm saying is, don't attach any spiritual significance to it. And the only time you make a mistake is that if you continually do something wrong that's hurting your body so you can't use it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what's wrong. You only got one. And you want to keep it running, and you want to keep it healthy, because we want to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. All right, let's cover exercise just for a moment. Look over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Just four verses down. Four verses down. Paul says, for bodily exercise, 1 Timothy 4 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that it now is and of that which is to come. All right? It says bodily exercise profits little. Now, I don't care what you say about physical fitness. I don't care what kind of health much you are. I don't care what you say. When it gets down to it, it says bodily exercise profits little. That's what the Word of God says. It says it profits little. All right? It doesn't say it profits at all and none, and it doesn't say you shouldn't do it. It says it profits little. When Paul wrote in his day, they didn't have automobiles, they didn't have television sets, they didn't sit around like you and I do. You know what most back problems are caused by? They're not caused by overwork, they're caused by underwork. That's not my opinion, that's the uh, statement from a physician that told me. He said most back problems are caused by people don't exercise the back. You ought to get some exercise. 
but it ought not to be a great deal. I'll tell you, there's some Christians that are, that are, that are hung up on this jogging and running to the point where they're gone two and three hours a day, jogging and running, and you know what's going to do? You're going to end up in a grave just like everybody else. You ought to exercise. I know in my own life where I have to draw the line on exercise. I know what I have to do to stay in shape, and I know when I'm going overboard. You ought to exercise because it'll make you feel better. You ought to exercise because you'll sleep better. You'll be surprised how sound you'll sleep if you'll get a little bit in shape. You ought to exercise because it'll make you sharper mentally. You get that blood circulating through you and get some exercise, and get that body exercise, it'll make you sharper mentally. Not only that, it'll give you some discipline in your life. Bodily exercise and discipline on the flesh. Now, it doesn't profit you much, but it does profit you some. I exercise because it, it just it, it relieves a pressure in my life. It's an emotional release for me. I exercise because I don't want to have to buy new clothes every six months. And I exercise, I exercise to keep my body fit so I can stay up later, so I can go harder, so I can keep going, and I'm not always dragging. That's why exercise. You say, how much should I exercise? I don't know how much you should exercise. I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not going to spend my life spending four or five hours a day running around playing basketball or jogging or playing softball, stuff like that, so I can keep in shape. Some people make a career out of staying in shape, you know? Brother, we're to stay in good physical condition so that we can do the work of the Lord, not just so we can have a good-looking body. See? Let me go on to something else. Weight and appearance. You live in a day and age where people absolutely worship a slim body. They worship. You know, there are very few of us that are built so that anybody would want to take a picture of us. Amen? I mean, the people you see on the magazines, you know, they have the picture physique. Every muscle is the right proportion. Every part of their body is in correct proportion to the others. I don't think there's anybody in here like that tonight, is there? You know something? I weighed, when I went to college, I weighed about 175 pounds. I lost 50 pounds and went down to 125 pounds. And when I was 125 pounds, I still had a little roll of fat around my side. I can't ever get rid of that thing. I mean, it's there with me till I go to the grave. I'd like to have one of these rippled stomachs, you know. I'll never get one. The only way I'll get a rippled stomach is to have a mold made, you know, it's got ripples in it and wear it like that. You'll never have one of those things. I feel sorry for these people that are always trying to look like the people on television. That's a sin. Brother, forget about what you look like. You know, some people's natural weight and appearance is not the slim picture that people have put out today. You've got a natural body weight. And some of you are going to be a slight bit heavy the rest of your life. And you know something? What people don't understand is... Sometimes you need to be a little bit heavier. I found that out about three years ago when I was working at this church. When I got here, I was eating about two meals a day. And uh, I, I had to, you know, change from the Marine Corps to here and had to adjust a little bit, so I cut down on my eating. And when Terry and I started working down here, brother, and I was eating two meals a day, I was eating breakfast and supper, you know something? I started pooping out about two o'clock in the afternoon. That hammer began to drag, you know, on the ground and everything. And I had to start eating more. And because I started eating more, I gained weight. But you know something? I needed the additional weight to accomplish the task that was involved. You know, some of these people, they diet and they diet and they diet and they get skinny and gaunt and their face drags like that. And man, they get get the flu and it likes to kill them, man. It likes to kill them. I mean, it puts them down for weeks. I mean, you get to this place where you worship your waistline and every time you go past the scale and you get on it, and every time you look in the mirror, you look at your body, that is a sinful thing. You're not supposed to give that much attention to flesh. You're not supposed to be able to stand in front of the mirror. How's that okay, thing? I've been going to the grave. It was a nickel. The only thing you want to do is keep it in shape so you can use it for the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got this thing today where Christians wor- wor- worship that kind of thing. You got these things in big churches where the only girls allowed to sing are the girls that look fashionable. See? You got this thing, the only boys that I do anything are the boys that have the athletic physique. I hate that stuff. I hate any sort of group of people, especially Christians, that put a premium 
on something that a guy, that a kid got that he didn't have anything to do with that. I hate that kind of thing. I, I brought up this example over and over again, but it, it, it's just something I never forget. We went to camp the uh, second summer I was here, and uh, uh, Brother Gary was there and Brother Stevie was there. Now, these boys are city boys. I mean, they can use a grinder, and uh, they can use a spray gun, but they don't swing too mean a softball bat. See? And uh, we were out there playing softball, you know, and uh, uh, they didn't hit it too well and didn't throw it too well. And there was a lot of, there was a big premium placed on that kind of stuff, see? And I got them aside after we quit one day, and I said, you know something, I want to tell you guys something. I don't care if you strike out every time you get up there. We're not here to hit a softball. I found out when I was teaching a class out there, when I asked them where to go in the Bible and lead somebody to Christ, my kids knew how to have kids do. Brother, you ain't working me. I was going to hit a softball, I'll switch the door, and you don't know none of that book, you don't know it. You know, these people that put a premium on that stuff, and they're Christians, man, they're saved, blood bought child of God. That stuff's rough. And I'm telling you, we've gotten to a place where we put so much attention on the flesh, we don't even know the difference. I want to know the difference. We worship the way we look. We worship the styles. We worship all these things. We want everybody to look just alike and just this and that way. I'm going to tell you something. You better get that stuff in the right perspective. And don't let anybody cast a snare upon you. Don't let anybody throw this stuff up to you. If you if, and brother, I'm going to tell you something. If you go to somebody's house and they put something on a table and you stick your nose up, they ought to stick their number nine right in your backside and kick you out the door. You've got these people walking to your house and they say, well... I don't like this and I don't like that. I feel like taking a plumber's friend, putting her mouth and <laughs> shove it down her throat. You know what's wrong with them people? They've never been out in the woods with a can of sea rats for about three weeks. What's wrong with them people? I mean, you get some wild stuff, man. I mean, missionaries, Chris, they come in you. Well, I, I, I don't like that. Tough apples, eat it anyway, man. Tough apples. I mean, somebody invites you over to eat, if it just doesn't quite cross your convictions, then let down your convictions and compromise. You say, is that Bible? Yeah, for me, destroy not the work of God. See? And you better watch this stuff. You get this natural food, food thing and it all ends up in one place, I'll guarantee it ends up in one place. It all ends up, when it comes down to the final thing, it ends up in a vegetarian diet every time. Every time. Every one of those things ends up finally, so you're just eating vegetables, and they say, eat, you know, eat this, it, it slows you down. Uh, don't take any of that meat. Oh, hogwash, man. They killed the fatted calf for the prodigal son. What are you trying to tell me? These guys tell you all this stuff. I mean, I, I, got, I, I got thinking about this stuff one time, and I was going to have my intestines cleaned out and all this stuff, you know, and good night, man. I got to thinking, I said, I can't have my life revolve around the bathroom, man. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, these people, they just go crazy on this stuff. They get to the point where they, you know, everything, you know, they, they, they pick through their food with a microscope, you know, see if there's anything in it. And that stuff's not biblical, and that stuff's not scriptural, and there's a bunch of people in this, in this United States that are beginning to preach these things as Bible convictions, and they're not Bible convictions. No. I don't know what this has to do with anything tonight. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I'm burdened over the fact that, that Christians don't know what's in the Bible and what's out of the Bible anymore. And I'm burdened over the fact that there's people preaching in this United States, preaching stuff from the pulpit that has no business being preached as Bible. And don't you ever get anybody, get, get them, get, get them hooking you into that stuff and thinking that there's some spiritual significance that's not. And you young people, let me tell you something. Maybe, maybe some of you young ladies, maybe you're never going to make them the, the, the cover of, of Seventeen magazine. All i got to say about that is praise the Lord. That's all i got to say about that. And maybe you'll never have a slender figure like uh, Cheryl Stiggs, or whatever her name is. Maybe you'll never look like her. And all i got to say about that is praise the Lord. Brother, the Bible says that the beauty is on the inward man, not on the outward. And if you're not going to make the, the spirit queen, maybe you will make the homecoming queen. Boy, if you work on that inside, you'll look good to God. And you'll be right, right attractive to some fellow looking for the right thing. And you fellas, maybe, maybe you're never going to, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe if you buy one of these warm-up suits, you, you'll, you'll still look like a 10 pounds of potatoes in a 5-pound sack. I don't know. 
They, you know, some of us were just built dumpy. You know, I, I look for, you know, on those things that says media, you know, build, uh, slight, medium, stocky, or whatever it is. I put one in there for me, it says dumpy. Dumpy. And then you'll be dumpy for the rest of your life. You know what's the difference? It don't make any difference, man. It don't make any difference. Get the stuff off the physical things and how you look and how you feel and get the inside right for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, you're going to be a lot happier than what this world is. Let's pray. Father, we pray you bless this message. And, and Father, uh, Lord, uh, you told us to preach the whole counsel of God. And Lord, uh, uh, I just trust maybe that someday down the line, some will be able to use this message. And Lord, I pray they wouldn't get uh, wound up in this stuff to the point where it becomes a snare to their life.